ads for the for the Facebook feed. Okay, so welcome back. Now we are going to have a talk with Dr. Damien Macam from DC Laboratory. Okay, and thanks, thanks a lot. Roger. I'd like to say uh, thanks, thanks to Joe and to all the organisers um, for organising this great event. It's hopefully the first of many Lebanese workshops on uh, quantum information. It's been a, a great to kind of watch the story unfold that Joe told earlier on about how he's kind of built the environment for quantum information here and all the courses that he's teaching. And uh, in an entirely selfish point of view, it's been really great to have an excellent student. I'm going to make Rawat blush again with all his uh, compliments, but he's, he's been really great. He's taught me lots of things along the journey. Um, but, you know, it's really... Um, exciting to see so many students here because you're the guys who uh, really push forward the research and um, exciting future for quantum information. So what I'm going to try and do um, in the next hour is tell you a little bit about the kind of research that we're doing and kind of what are the exciting questions that we view for, for quantum information in general and tell you a little bit about what quantum information is about. In particular, our area of research on uh, quantum networks, okay? <coughs> All right. So to start with, kind of, I'll give you a bit of background why people are so excited about quantum information, okay? So we've seen a lot about it in the press, we hear from, uh, from Joe, and there's a lot of kind of excitement from a lot of people, including these big companies like Google, IBM, Intel, Microsoft, Atos. And so there are really kind of four areas where quantum information, so the idea of quantum information is that you're asking questions and encoding questions like computational questions or communication questions into quantum systems and because of the fundamental difference of how quantum physics behaves, you get different ways that this information can be processed. So the kind of fundamental understanding that led to quantum information is that the laws of information processing depend on the laws of physics of your information carriers. Okay? So it turns out that when you encode into quantum systems, you can get some incredible benefits. Okay? So you've heard of, of many of these, I guess, right? So in computation, famously, there's the big, uh, big um, uh, result, big algorithm, Shor's algorithm, which factors large numbers into primes, which has one particular incredible use case, which is that there will crack most of the cryptography that's used on the internet right now. So we'll crack RSA, so as soon as you've got a big quantum computer, so it's what Seth Lloyd calls the killer app, you have this algorithm which suddenly is going to make redundant most of the cryptography which is used currently uh, on the internet. So there is obviously a massive kind of research in entirely classical cryptography in trying to find classical crypto systems which will be kind of, uh, which will work against these quantum computers. Some other kind of recent um, developments in quantum computing are in quantum machine learning and in uh, quantum random walks and quantum search. And we'll hear a bit from Rawad later today about quantum sampling problems. Okay? And so, these, so currently, at the moment, we have, we, I say we, there is in the field, um, systems of around 40 to 70 qubits, and even recently, even a bit more, like 90 qubits. So Google have these, these chips where they have 90 qubits or so. And this is significant because as soon as you have 100 qubits, okay, just the sheer kind of scaling of the parameters involved, which is exponential, as soon as you've got 100 qubits, it's something that can't be simulated perfectly by a classical computer. So you, this is kind of what Joe mentioned about kind of checking your computation. These, these, as soon as you've got this 100 plus, uh, qubits, you're beyond what can be done with even the most powerful classical computing. Okay? So we're still far from being able to achieve these applications because of exactly what Joe mentioned about uh, decoherence and noise. Okay? So these 100 qubits, it's true that it's beyond classical, but really to get the advantage, as far as we understand, one needs to do kind of noiseless versions of these qubits, and that's much, much harder. So one of the kind of motivations for Rawad's research, actually, is what can we do with these noisy qubits, and maybe we can still prove some kind of advantage. Okay. So another area... Hmm. My slide's not... I don't know if... Well, okay, I'll use my hand. 
Ah, it's working now. Okay, I was just too far away. Um, okay, so another area which is almost like a subfield of computation, but is so kind of broad already that kind of one can uh, identify it separately is quantum simulation. So this is really like specialized computation where you might build a device which is not capable of universal quantum computation, but can be used for simulating particular quantum systems. And indeed, this was kind of one of the original motivations by, by Richard Feynman when he kind of talked about what a quantum computer might be, is that it can, if you want to model quantum systems, you should use quantum systems, okay? And it's really about this kind of exponential growth in the parameter space, okay? So quantum, quantum simulations, as this kind of specialized devices, have massive applications for quantum chemistry, drug development, material science, and in many body physics, okay? So here again, there are systems being built of the current kind of state of the art is around 100 qubits. And here, again, the noise, the role that noise plays in these is not entirely clear, so it's a big area of investigation to understand whether already these kind of quantum simulations of these systems are doing something that we can't check with a classical computer and that we can't perform with a classical computer. Okay. Another kind of big area of quantum information, so the kind of one of the halves of how this whole field started is in quantum communication. Okay, so the, the kind of first big result in quantum communication was this quantum key distribution, which is about how two parties communicate securely between each other. Okay? And since then, there have been kind of lots and lots more kind of protocols that one can think of, like delegated quantum computation. So if, if Google eventually build this quantum computer, how do I use it if I don't trust Google to keep my information safe, or et cetera, et cetera. Okay, and communication complexity, when we have, you know, the, the current, the way the internet works, a big kind of bottleneck in how we can use this is how fast we can transmit information. And it turns out that there are these protocols where you can gain exponential advantage using uh, quantum encoding of your information. Okay. And so here, the kind of where we're at in terms of technology, we have quantum limits and optical fiber. So we'll hear a bit about um, quantum repeaters from uh, Rajat tomorrow. We have these links of 100 kilometers through optical fibers. And very recently, in the last few years, we have these satellites connecting two points of thousands of kilometers. Okay, so it's really impressive. An area which is perhaps kind of less well known in quantum information is um, quantum sensing. So this is the idea that when you, if you want to measure a system, probing it with quantum systems, you can get an accuracy that's far better than you can possibly get through any kind of classical probes, okay? And these have massive applications in medical imaging, in mass detection, in quantum accelerometers and quantum clocks, okay? So this is by far the most kind of developed in terms of technology of all of these fields, okay? But just to kind of, here you kind of see an overview of all the different areas where quantum information is starting to have an impact. And you see why across the world, so in funding agencies like in the EU, the EU have given a billion euros to quantum technologies. Big companies like Google and IBM and all of these guys are putting into, um, putting lots of money, masses of money into building these quantum technologies. And there are hundreds and hundreds of startups happening all the time in quantum technologies. Okay, so it's a real kind of exciting field that's kind of growing um, incredibly. Okay, so I'm going to talk the rest of today. So for me, one of the most exciting things about quantum information is, of course, watching this technology emerge is incredible. But for me, the kind of really exciting thing is it's, it really allows us to touch fundamental ideas in physics with incredible applications technologically. So this kind of bridge between these foundational questions and you know, building something that you're gonna be able to sell to Evernote or uh, Everteam, sorry, is, is really exciting, okay? So there's a few things before I start that I hope you can come away with from this talk at the very least. First of all, we have this impression that quantum mechanics is very kind of strange and magical. It's not strange and magical, it's, it's beautiful, but it's not magic, okay? And so, um, one of the things that I think kind of, you know, my background is physics. I'm really interested in the kind of foundational questions of physics, how we understand the universe, etc. So one of the very exciting things about quantum information is, once we start playing with these quantum devices, these things that look so strange to us before, like Bell non-locality, they become very familiar to us. 
Okay? And so these ideas that seem very strange now, I think in 20 years, everyone going, of course, it's just a violation of the value equality. There's nothing magic there at all. So I think this will be actually, in kind of philosophical terms, in the development of science, one of the greatest developments of quantum information, even if we never build a quantum computer. So it's, it's not weird or magic, it is beautiful, and it's not just about the quantum computer or quantum key distribution. So these kind of examples that I gave, there's many, many, many of these guys, and so we're still exploring how these quantum technologies are actually gonna impact our, our lives in the future, okay? And so what I'll talk about is a bit more on, on these kind of topics now. Okay, so just to kind of, again, give you an idea of the technologies that are involved in these, there are qubits, which are our kind of information, informational, quantum informational kind of units of information. So like bits, we have the qubits, which is just a quantum version of these guys, a quantum, any quantum two-dimensional system. And as in classical information processing, the way that the physical system that we use to encode these can be very varied, okay, and really depend on the application, okay. So there are many kind of different kinds of qubits that come in all different shapes and sizes, okay. So, so here we have these kind of big algorithms using ion traps or superconducting qubits which take up a great kind of experimental space and, and, and lots of kind of um, cryogenic chambers to control them and all these sorts of things which would be used for algorithms and simulation. And then we have much smaller devices like integrated optical chips or integrated semiconductor chips which can be really, really small and this is kind of a big area of development for the field of quantum information. Okay? And all of these devices can be connected in many different ways. Okay, so for example, through optical fiber, or recently, as we talked about, through satellite links. Okay, so there are many kind of different physical devices, and this is another kind of part of the field that the development of quantum information spans a huge area of kind of science and engineering and mathematics. And so one of the kind of big things that we try and do as a community is to try and engage different communities. You know, so imagine all the physics that's going on in all of these types of devices, it's, it's massive. And so we all still need to be able to somehow talk the same language. And that's a kind of a big, exciting part of the field, but also one of its challenges. Okay, so I'll talk now about our kind of vision of where we see all of this heading and what guides a lot of the research that we're doing in our group in uh, Lipsis and with collaborators in Europe and around the world and here in Lebanon. Okay. So the idea is now we can imagine, given this background, we've got these quantum devices which are getting better and better, and they're of different sizes and different capacities, and they're developing all the time, okay? So we still don't know what a quantum computer is going to look like, but eventually, hopefully, there will be a few of these big quantum computers that are spread across the world, and there will be many more smaller devices, like you know, smaller quantum simulators or special purpose computational devices, and there will be many, many, many more, much smaller uh, quantum devices. So one can imagine, for example, a kind of quantum chip in your, in your smartphone, which allows you to communicate or do some very limited quantum tasks between you know, your phone and everything else, okay? And so the question is, so you've got these different size quantum devices connected through classical channels and quantum channels, and the question is, what can we do with this? And we call this this kind of a vision of the quantum network, of the quantum internet that we can imagine in the future. And so what we're really trying to do in our research is understand how we can develop this, how we can understand it, and how we can start to build this guy, okay? And so once we can do this, there are all these kind of applications which will emerge in secure communication, efficient communication, delegated computing, delegated sensing. You can imagine this is like a... You know, if you've got these sensors here, it's really like a quantum version of the Internet of Things, for example. Okay. So we're really kind of trying to push the limits of what this guy can, can offer us. Okay. So the way we do this is kind of focused on four main families of questions. Okay. So the kind of starting point, if you like, in some cases, is applications and protocols. Okay. So it's developing like a secure multi-party computation, these delegated tasks, quantum Internet of Things, etc. But at the same time, we want to understand what it is, what's the quantum mechanics, what's the physics inside of here that makes all of this work. And then we want to be able to demonstrate this. Okay? So we want to be able to prove that actually this isn't just something that I can write down on a whiteboard, which is really nice, or give a talk about. It's something that people can build. And so you'll hear tomorrow from, from Eleni about the experimental efforts that are made on demonstrating these um, feasibility of these quantum networks. Okay? 
And then right at the heart of this is actually something that we've recently started working on is once you've got all these components, how do I put them all together and develop a kind of network architecture? So how is this network going to look like? How am I going to distribute my quantum resources? How do I talk about these different quantum resources in terms of routing of these resources or quantum versions of these network stacks and benchmarking? Okay, so these are the kind of four areas we'll talk about. But before we go into those, I'll talk about a bit the kind of, you know, the, the very exciting part for me of this is where these foundations of formalisms, where, where is the quantum, what are the quantum elements of, of this that's going to give us these advantages, okay? And what we'll see later is kind of, this may sound like a very kind of nice uh, physics or philosophical sorts of questions, but they're actually really important in understanding all the different aspects of how we're going, applications that we're going to develop, how we're going to develop our proof of principle demonstrations, and how our um, architecture should look like. Okay. So, what is the quantum in quantum? Okay. So, what, what makes quantum information different from classical information processing? Okay. And there are many possible answers to this, and I'm not going to give you the answer. I'm just going to give you some of the ideas that, that have kind of come up recently in our research and, and in the field. Okay. So a, kind of a good point to start in trying to understand the difference between quantum physics and classical physics and how it can play a role in information processing is looking at polarization. So a lot of the experiments that we've heard about and that we'll hear about, the encoding of our information is into polarization. Okay. And so most of you here will have actually encountered some, some of the physics of polarization, even if you know it or not, with polarized sunglasses. Okay. So polarizing sunglasses these are just filters which stop photons coming through that are, have a certain polarization. Okay? So you can notice this if you tilt your head when you're wearing sunglasses. You'll see a difference in the amount of light that comes through from reflections because reflections are, are polarized. Okay? When, when light reflects, it's the polarized light that comes out predominantly. And that's why they're useful, because they're useful for skiing and surfing and blah, 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 all these things. Okay? But the physics of these lenses is actually... To understand this fully, we need quantum mechanics, okay? And there's some very simple um, examples where you can see these quantum mechanical effects come through the sunglasses. And you can do these yourself. If you've got three pairs of polarizing sunglasses or, or polarizing filters for your camera, you can just do these, uh, do these checks yourself, okay? Okay, and so you notice that any, you can kind of, if you're wandering around the world and you see someone doing this with their sunglasses on, they're probably a physicist who's heard something about this too. It's very funny. I told my friends who were all like, no one's doing physics at all before when we were on holiday once and everyone was suddenly walking around like this and came away from the holiday with a bad neck. So do be careful. Okay. But, so, so you know, it's, to, it's, it's also to say that there are kind of devices that we use every day that have these quantum mechanical effects to really to understand them. So there are, you know, to really understand them, we need quantum mechanics. Okay, so what does a polarizing filter do? It, it takes light, which is polarized on all different planes. So I guess everyone's kind of got an understanding of polarization, but the idea is that light described as a wave propagates along an axis, along a direction, and it can be along this axis or this axis or whichever axis. And what a polarizing filter does, like this one, is it only allows the light through that goes, that is polarized in this direction, okay? And when we describe light as a particle, we can think of it as a little pulse of this wave, okay? Okay, so that's what a polarizing filter does. And so you can kind of see that this is happening because if you take a, if you take a bunch of light that comes through, you let it go through the filter that only allows it vertically. And if you put afterwards a horizontal filter, then no light is going to get through. Okay, so you take two filters, and this you can do if you take two pairs of sunglasses. The sunglasses is just focused in one direction. You take another pair. If you rotate them to a certain angle, if you've got two pairs, no light will get through these guys. Okay? Okay, so, and similarly, as one would expect, if I move the, if I remove the first filter, then uh, more light will get through. Okay, and so there's, a, there's, a, there's already something on a quantum mechanical level here that's happening which is that measuring on different bases will give uh, different effects if you do them one after each other, which is something we call quantum com incompatibility of these different measurements. But this is something technical about how these measurements work. But the idea is um, essentially these act as filters. Okay? 
Okay, so if we have these two filters, they, uh, they act exactly as we imagine filters would. So the very strange thing that you can kind of, the first hint that something strange is going on with quantum mechanics is now if I take these two filters and I put a third filter in the middle, so remember if I've got these two filters, no light's coming out here. Okay, so I've got exactly the same source here and, uh, and I've got exactly the same detector over here, no light's coming through. Suddenly, if I put a third filter in, I get light coming out. And so this is very strange now. In terms of this filter point of view, it looks totally, totally strange, okay? And indeed, this is the kind of first hint that something quantum mechanical is going on here, okay? So it turns out that this is really linked to the non-locality of Bell's inequality or contextuality or all these kind of what we think of as strange quantum features can kind of be understood as thinking of single photons going through these polarizers. And this is something you can do with your sunglasses, right? You don't need billions of uh, dollars of experimental apparatus to see this guy. You do need to believe that you're only seeing single photons, but okay, we'll live with that. <coughs> okay, so to understand this, you kind of on a quantum mechanical level, you should try and think of how these single photons work. And what are the properties of the single photons? And this is where we kind of start coming into what differentiates quantum and classical. Okay? So it's how do we describe the properties of these photons? So here, you know, I've drawn these as polarizations in this axis or this axis or this axis. And is that the right way to describe these? It turns out that actually what we need is these Hilbert spaces, quantum mechanics, etc., etc., which have no kind of classical correspondence in the way that I'll say in a second, okay? So quantum mechanically, how do we see this? Well, actually, if I had a, a photon that comes in, which is not polarized in this angle, but it's not polarized horizontally, it's something in between, 45 degrees, say, then the output is probabilistic, okay? So this is something essentially quantum mechanical, okay? And so this is really kind of the heart of, of how we use these kind of effects, is that they're probabilistic, okay? So we say, in the language of quantum mechanics, we say this photon is projected onto the direction of the measurement or it's absorbed into the filter, okay? And so one can kind of very easily follow in quantum mechanics, you can write down the equations and these equations are super simple. So I can actually give you a quick example later on just to prove to you that it's not difficult and it's not magic. The equations are very straightforward, it's just linear algebra, like uh, it's just little, little matrices, it's no problem. Okay, and so you do these calculations in the way that quantum mechanics prescribes and you see that indeed light should be coming out. Okay, so fine, so, but the, so what's the difficulty here? What's the kind of difference between this and classical? Is in classical mechanics and in classical physics, everything can be described as a property of the photon and measurements are just extracting information about that property. And in quantum mechanics, these measurements behave differently. They change the property of these systems. And this is something um, that kind of gives rise to these strange quantum effects. OK, so let's step back a bit and kind of think about where these probabilities come from. So back in the kind of founding of quantum mechanics in the 30s, people already recognized that these probabilities that come from quantum mechanics were somehow an issue. Okay? So the, one of the great successes of physics up until that point was that we don't actually need to think about uh, probabilities, is that, you know, we've got Newtonian mechanics, we've got um, electromagnetism, and with these we can predict exactly what's going to happen at all times, as long as we know enough of information about our systems. So in classical physics, the only place where probabilities come up is because we don't know exactly what's going on. We don't know our systems already, okay? So in classical physics, Randomness only happens because of our ignorance of the situation, okay? So, for example, a kind of neat example is in statistical physics. In statistical physics, we use probabilities. We talk about a Boltzmann distribution for a gas, for example. And these probabilities only come up, we have a model for this, which says, well, actually, these probabilities aren't inherently physics aren't inherently physical, all it comes from is that there are so many, you know, molecules inside my box that I can't keep track of. But if I knew, so if I think of, you know, the classic statistical physics problem is uh, a gas in a box, and I want to know what's the pressure on one wall, for example, okay? So if we do that in statistical physics, we get some probability statement about it. And the reason is because we don't know the position and momentum of every gas particle inside. If we did, 
if we knew the position and momentum of every single particle inside this box, we would know the force on the wall of this box at any one time. Okay? The fact that we don't and the way that we get our probability distributions in statistical physics is instead we take a, we say, well, each of these is kind of equally likely. We take a random mixture of this, and this is exactly what gives you your Boltzmann distribution. Okay? So, you know, a natural question is, so here we have a situation where randomness does indeed appear in classical physics, but this randomness is just because we don't actually know what's going on inside the box. Okay? Somehow the values of these positions and momentum of my gas particles are all hidden to me. So the question is, if, could this actually be what's happening with quantum mechanics? Okay? So could it be that if I knew something more about my photon, if I knew the true description of this photon, you know, what's going on inside this box, then I would know exactly what I should get from these measurements. Okay? And this was the idea that was kind of put forward in this paper by Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen in 1935, is, is there a kind of better version of quantum mechanics where I don't need these probabilities, where these kind of values which would fix the outcome of my measurements are maybe hidden to us, but they exist. Okay? And one can kind of see in these examples that actually, even here, this example, as simple as it is, says that no, that can't be the case. Okay? And so how can we see that? Well, so, you know, again, I have to convince myself, first of all, that I'm talking about single photons. But what, what are the possible outcomes of these measurements? Okay? And outcomes of these measurements are that I either go through a filter or I get absorbed by this filter. Okay? So whatever's going on inside this guy, right? So you can imagine each of these is this little box, right? Where there's all these different degrees of freedom inside which tell me whether I should perfectly go through or not. But there is some configuration of these hidden variables, which says I should go through this, and there are some configurations which said I don't, okay? So for every, if I think about kind of what happens for gases in the box, okay, for every particular situation that I start with, um, it will either, a particle will either hit the wall or it won't hit the wall. And so the same should be true here. For every particular kind of assignment of whatever these values are, I should either get absorbed or not. We're, this is what Einstein called this element of reality, is going through this filter or not going through this filter. And so if you do this photon by photon, then you kind of assign to each of these, each of these photons, I'm going to go through this one, but I'm not going to go through that one. Okay? So these are my assignments of, of these, um, these, these photons. Okay? So every individual photon, so this is why it's important to think of it as a single photon, will either get absorbed or it won't get absorbed, depending on these things. Okay? that maybe I can't control and maybe I can't see, but I can see whether it goes through or not. Okay? So one can kind of see through this that I, I fix the value of when I send it through a horizontal plane, I'm, going to get, I'm not going to get absorbed. And when I send it through a, sorry, when I send it vertical, it's not going to get absorbed. And when I send it through a horizontal, it will get absorbed. That's what this experiment tells me. Okay? So whatever my hidden variables are, they have to match this. And now I'm kind of at a conundrum. Okay? So there's no way of assigning whether I get through this second one, which should suddenly change this, this element. Okay? So the, the idea of classical measurements is whether I go through this filter or not shouldn't depend on whether I've made an interim measurement. Okay? So this is something inherently quantum mechanical. Okay. So there's no kind of labeling of my photons which can, which can give me this, uh, which can tell me, predict the same values as quantum mechanics gives me. Okay? And so if you take these two photons far apart from each other, this is exactly what's going on in, um, in Bell's inequality and in these Bell violations. Okay? It's just like a non-local version of these games. Okay? Okay. And so the key, key kind of essential point here is that what these arguments tell us is that the randomness that happens in quantum mechanics is somehow different from the randomness that happens in classical mechanics, in classical physics. Okay? And the, the essential difference is that this randomness is not just an ignorance of the state of my system. Okay? And it turns out that this difference is something which is really useful for security, um, for computational capacity, etc., etc. Okay? okay, so quantum randomness is not just this ignorance. This is the first point. Okay? So if you want to understand a big difference between quantum mechanics and classical physics, Quantum randomness is something inherent in the theory that cannot be explained by ignorance in the same way classical randomness can. Okay, so um, 
That sounds a bit strange. Sounds a bit like weird magic, and I told you it wasn't weird magic. Well, OK. So to convince you of this, you can kind of see the kind of calculations that we do in this. So there will be maybe three or four equations in this as, uh, in this talk. To, uh, I'm a theorist, so I have to include a couple of equations. But. Um, anyway, so this is the kind of math that's involved, and it's really straightforward linear algebra. OK, so if I wanted to do these calculations, this randomness is a projection on this uh, vector space, um, and entanglement is just somehow how these two vector spaces combine themselves with two systems. Okay, but we won't go into more of this. It's just to tell you that all of the calculations we do in these experiments, in this example, everyone here in this room, I'm sure, could do the calculations for this. It's not hard. It's not hard calculations. The stuff Rawad does, and that you know, when we take many of these systems together and we want to prove statements of security, then it gets much more involved, and we talk about you know how to combine all these things, but um, these simple examples like this and the simple protocols like quantum key distribution and teleportation, they're very simple um, calculations. I mean, this is why, why Joe can give a course in 24 hours on this stuff. Okay, so this is, how these, uh, these, this is how these kind of calculations look like. I won't go into any details, but those of you who've been on Joe's course, this will look familiar. Okay. All right, so maybe the mathematics is simple and I can do these predictions, but um, I haven't told you what I can do with this. I've just said that quantum randomness is different from classical randomness. So how do we get from there to seeing how it's useful for computation and security? Okay, so I'll give you a bit of an idea of how this works. And the idea comes through this very um, famous example called the Perez Merman magic square. Okay, so really what we're looking for is, is something that kind of identifies the difference between classical strategies and quantum strategies, okay? And so a classical strategy or a classical model has to assign values to whenever you perform a measurement in classical physics. If you know everything about your system, the value of this measurement is determined exactly by the state of your system, okay? You know, the momentum, the position, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So now imagine the following game, okay? Um, and this is what's called the Paris Merman magic square, and it kind of identifies how this might be useful, okay? And in the end, it comes out about correlations between values and consistency of, of uh, assigning these values, okay? And so it turns out that because quantum mechanics doesn't necessarily have to assign the value to the measurement outcome beforehand, like classical mechanics does, this gives it an extra freedom, which is very powerful for computation and very powerful for security. All right, so how does this work? So the game is as follows. You're given a grid, a nine by nine grid. And what you want to do is fill this grid with plus or minus ones, such that if I take the product of this grid, it gives me plus one. If I take the product of this row, sorry, it gives me plus one. If I take the product of this row, it gives me minus one. And this column gives me plus one. This column gives me plus one. This column gives me plus one, OK? So this is what I'd like to do. This is my game, OK? So I say I've won the game if I satisfy these constraints. And it's kind of called the magic square because there is no classical set of uh, assignments which can satisfy this. And what we'll see is that there is a quantum set of assignments that can. Okay, so this is somehow what we talk about. Okay, so we may start with, I just start adding in my plus minus ones. And I can see, okay, I've got a minus one here, so I'm probably going to want a minus one here. But I have to be careful because I want this to be plus one. So maybe I try the following. I know this doesn't work because I didn't cancel this minus one for this column. Okay. One can try another assignment. Oh, well, I put an extra minus one here, but then I'm in trouble because I don't get the minus one here anymore. Okay. And so you can kind of convince yourself that actually there is no assignment of plus or minus ones that do this. Okay. The way that we can do that is I think of what is the total product of all the values in my grid. And this should be, if I think of, you know, what's the product of this, 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 then it should be the product of these three. Okay? And similarly, if I did the columns, it's exactly the same. So one can kind of see this very simple proof that there is no assignment of plus or minus ones that satisfies my, my constraints of the game. Okay? And so this is where we start to kind of see actually how there can be things quantum mechanically which can't be done classically. Here we have what's called the constraint problem. So many problems in computation, etc. If I want to, you know, if I want to calculate what's the minimum energy state of some material, it's a constraint problem. It's, you know, what are the 
you know, uh, assignment of values which give me the smallest energy. These are the sorts of questions that we ask on a much bigger scale, okay? But one can start to see here, there are, quest there are kind of constraints that cannot be satisfied by any classical assignment of values. And of course, it turns out that quantum mechanically, you can satisfy these. So it turns out, I can tell you all these sets of measurements, and the, I can think of these as polarization measurements as well. So the kind of systems that Joe was talking about, if I have two entangled photons, doing measurements on these guys is exactly using these polarizing um, beam splitters, et cetera. It exactly kind of gives me these predictions, okay? So quantum mechanics now, this strange assignment, random assignment of values in quantum mechanics says, well, each of these individual values might be random, but it is in such a way that these set of constraints will be satisfied always, okay? So in quantum mechanics, these measurements are very particular, actually, because in the end, it doesn't matter which state you give me. If I can do these measurements perfectly, then I'll always see these different kind of constraints, okay? So this randomness, which on the one hand is very troubling philosophically because it's not due to the randomness, it's something inherent, it's not due to our ignorance, sorry, it's something inherent in our system. It turns out that it's fundamentally different from the randomness that I can have in classical physics, and guess what, we can actually use this difference. Because this difference allows me to do things that I couldn't do classically, like win this game. And you can think of all the stuff we can do in quantum information, can be thought of as some gain that I'm winning by encoding into quantum systems that I'm not winning in terms of classical systems. And so the way this kind of works out, there are two features of quantum mechanics that if you study these courses, just to say, you'll hear about one is compatibility, so I mentioned about which measurements can be made at the same time, and what's called contextuality. So this notion of contextuality is nothing except that in classical systems, I can always assign a value of my outcomes, and in quantum systems, I cannot, and we call that contextuality. Okay. Okay, so... It turns out, so the whole idea, the whole point of this game is there are certain problems that I can think of where the constraints are impossible to satisfy with classical physics at all, okay? But I can satisfy them quantum mechanically. And it turns out that this constraint problem can be leveraged into a provable quantum advantage. So you can prove that circuits, there are quantum computational circuits of fixed length, okay? So they stop after some fixed point, which is independent of the number of inputs, which cannot be achieved by any fixed length classical circuit, okay? And related, related to this actually is the, um, the speed up that Rawad will talk about later, which is there are sampling problems where you can prove again that no classical computer can do the same thing, okay? So, um, so, the, so we know these examples where these constraints are used for quantum computing, and indeed it's, it's not understood if this is behind all the speed up in quantum computing, but it's expected that it plays a major part, and that's actually what we'll hear about a bit tomorrow afternoon as well from uh, Ellie. Um, but it's also a great, new, a great resource for quantum networks, security, speed up, and delegation, okay? So now I'm going to kind of just tell you a bit. So this is kind of one of the most essential differences between quantum and classical. And one of the things that we do in our research is try and understand, well, is this the resource or are there other elements and other kind of ways that quantum mechanics behave, which are also useful resources and how do we kind of categorize these? And so it's really like developing a resource theory for these kind of strange quantum features. And it's very beautiful because you know, these ideas started in 1935. And they sound very philosophical, right? It's about what are elements of reality, okay? And now it turns out, like uh, many, many years later, that these guys are really useful for future quantum technologies. Okay. Okay, so I'll tell you a bit now about kind of how we, where do we go from here, how, the kind of questions that we're asking for resources, quantum resources for quantum networks, and how we're gonna apply them, okay? And I'll come back to this picture of how all of these things, these different, problems, these different big questions in developing quantum networks interact. And so this is one of the kind of exciting points of the field is kind of the interaction between these foundations, almost philosophy questions about elements of nature of reality, tell us something about how we can use them, how we should build our quantum networks, and how we can demonstrate our quantum advantage in the best way. Okay. Okay. 
So we'll kind of start with some of these questions that we've been asking about what are the identification of these resources, okay? So this kind of quantum randomness is one resource, and there are many others that we might think of in quantum information, and there are scales of these resources. So I'm going to focus on one particular question, which is, what are the resources needed for delegated verified computation? Okay, so the setting is that Google have finally built a quantum computer or a quantum simulator, but nobody trusts Google, right? Like the, you know, the NSA have got their back doors, blah, blah, blah. So they've got all the information. We want to make sure that they're doing the computation we're asking them to do and that they don't have all the information that we don't want them to do. Okay, and we call that a kind of delegated verified computation because we want to verify that the computation is correct um, and we want to delegate it in a way, in a trusted way. Okay, so it's kind of like a quantum cloud or something like this. So we imagine we have a very powerful uh, Google or IBM or whoever builds the first quantum computer. Probably it'll happen in China, I don't know. Um, they've probably got one or whatever. But anyway, we, 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 we want to use this in a remote way. So we imagine a very powerful server, but they're not trusted, and a very weak client that may have some quantum technologies, but not very much, or may even have no quantum technologies, and may be able to communicate with the server, the server by classical and or quantum channels, okay? So the question we're interested from a foundation's point of view is, what are the resources that we need in this situation? Okay. And so there are three kind of families of resources that kind of speak to this kind of two-party situation where you have a server and a client, okay? And there are three, res three families of resources that we've recognized in the development of quantum information as being powerful, okay? So the first is this Balmont locality, which is exactly what I talked about, okay? So this, if you like, is really a kind of manifestation of precisely the gap between classical and quantum randomness, okay? And there are these two others that I'll talk about. One is entanglement and one is steering. And how do we differentiate these resources? Well, in this direction, these guys requires no trust in our devices. So one can think from a practical point of view, what are these different resources? Well, if I want to use what I'm going to call entanglement resource, that means I trust my devices. So maybe I built them myself and I trust exactly what they're doing. If I trust one side and I trust who's using these devices, if I trust one side, um, but not the other, we call this steering. And if I don't trust either side, so maybe my devices I bought from somewhere else that I don't trust these devices, it turns out that you can guarantee security just based on the statistics that your devices give you, because somehow your statistics tell you that you've got this kind of quantum randomness rather than your classical randomness. Okay, so let's be a bit more explicit. So entanglement is you share some kind of quantum state, the way that we talk about these resources is really in a kind of operational way, okay? So there's a kind of quantum information likes to take these, these physics ideas and put them into some information um, theoretic statements, okay? So the way that we do this in terms of these families of resources is we imagine our devices, we've represented beautifully by these boxes, um, and we ask them a question, which could be X, okay? So this X might tell you which polarization you're, you're measuring. You know, if I'm measuring polarization in this direction or this direction, okay? And then A is your answer, okay? So it's like it went through or it got absorbed. And similarly, on the other side, okay? So imagine this is in the hands of the um, weak client, for example, and this is in the hands of the server, so these two parties, okay? And so when we talk about a correlation um, based on entanglement resources, this is saying something like, we trust these devices. And what does that mean in terms of the calculations that I do? All it means is I have a perfect description of these measurements here, okay? So those of you who've done some quantum mechanics courses, what happens is we can write down, if I know exactly the measurement that's going on here and I know exactly the state, I can write down exactly the statistics of these measurements I should get. That's kind of what quantum mechanics does as a theory, okay? So saying, I trust my measurement devices, here just translates to, I know the calculation to make, okay? So I know these measurements and I can calculate this. So steering now is a kind of next level of, of reducing the trust where I'm not going to, I'm going to trust one of my devices, so I know the measurements I'm making here, but I might not trust this device, okay? So I don't know what this, this device is doing. Maybe it's even collaborating with uh, the source that sends my resources or something like this. So I have perfect knowledge about the measurements that's happening here, but here I'm allowed any kind of 
classical strategy of, uh, of uh, that I want. Okay, so and um, mathematically represent this by here. I know exactly the measurement that I'm performing, and here I allow any correlated strategy between the output of me and um, the output on this side and the original resource that's, that's shared between these two parties. Okay. So mathematically, all this difference is, is that here I know the exact measurement, and here I'm just allowing anything at all, okay? And so in Balnon locality, it's really now a total dark situation where I don't trust this device and I don't trust this device. All I do is kind of step what, check what's happening about these statistics, so I know nothing about the origin of these measurements, and I know nothing about the origin of these measurements. And so if I think back to this magic square example, we went through some potential classical um, assignments of values, and so this is really like saying, I don't know which classical assignment I'm getting. And remarkably, in quantum mechanics, because of this kind of quantum uh, randomness, because we can have these assignments of values in quantum mechanics that I can't achieve classically, it turns out these actually can tell us something about security, etc., etc. Okay, and so I can kind of quantify the difference between these different kinds of resources by the so-called CHSH Bell inequality that we heard a little bit about from Joe, and that you'll hear a bit about more later later in these talks as well. Okay. So, back to our question, which of these three families of resources are the important resources for, quantum, um, for delegated quantum computing? Okay. So, at the time we started asking these questions, there were essentially two, two known results. And one of them has an entirely classical computer communicating to a classical client, which communicates with two very powerful quantum servers that need to share in front of them before. And this protocol allows you to do secure verified computation as long as these two computers don't talk to each other. And it explicitly uses these BAL non-local correlations. Okay, so here we know exactly the resource that's used. And I should say, by the way, something I didn't mention here is that these ones are very easy to manufacture. So you can buy devices now which give you your entangled correlations which are useful for all these kind of things. BAL non-locality is something that's only ever kind of experimentally been done two or three times for the first time in 2015. So there's very few laboratories in the world that can do that in a really genuine um, loophole-free way. Okay? So as, you know, as a technology, we're really interested in pushing ourselves up here. Okay? Okay, so what are the trusts needed and what are the resources needed? So the other family of um, protocols that we looked at that, that were known at the time where these clients prepare um, this, where we have a single um, powerful server and a single client, but the client has some quantum power, okay? So their quantum power is to prepare and send individual um, quantum states, okay? So they know the state they're sending in a trusted way, okay? And, but what was really unclear here is what are the resources necessary? And so why is that unclear? Just to say a little bit more is that I know with these resources, I could do Balmain locality, right? So if I control this resources well enough, I can do Balmain locality. So the question was, is it necessary for the security of this protocol, okay? So it sounds like a, you know, it sounds like a very abstract question. And indeed, the techniques that we had to develop to prove the answer, which by the way, happens to be no. So it turns out that for this problem, you don't need non-local correlations. I don't need this fully non-classical randomness. Um, I, can, I can make do with steering correlations. But the way that we prove this is really kind of a roundabout way through some very kind of fundamental physics uh, that brought us back around this. And the way that we did this was by looking at this so-called Speckens toy qubits. Okay? So this is now, again, back in the foundations of physics, people wanted to say, well, actually, a lot of what I get in quantum mechanics, I can do with classical models, okay? And what it turns out, so this is a kind of toy classical theory, which mimics a lot of what happens quantum mechanics, but of course it can't have this non-locality. It can't have randomness, which is truly quantum, okay? And it turns out what we showed with my student at the time, Leonardo, was that these, this theory is actually enough to do delegated uh, computation, okay? So it turns out for this case, I don't need the full nature of quantum randomness. I can make do with some, this, this resource that we call steering, okay? And so 
in our kind of broader research now, going back to this bigger picture of um, quantum networks and our development of this, this, this kind of little, very kind of foundational result about what are the resources useful for our application, act as like a seed for all these different questions, okay? So we'll see how it kind of gives you something in terms of applications and how I can um, perform proof of principle demonstrations and how it's related to the development of an architecture. So first of all, for applications, it's kind of clear that the application that we have in mind in these delegated protocols, understanding what my quantum resource is, gives me a good way of developing these protocols. And indeed, so first of all, we have this delegated verified universal computation based only on steering, but we can kind of apply this to all sorts of delegated tasks, okay? So delegated sub-universal computation, delegated simulation, delegated sensing, et cetera, et cetera. And so our goals here are to make these more practical and the better optimization of resources. And the way these kind of our research environment works is in collaboration with um, research groups in the University of Edinburgh, in Singapore, and with companies like SAP, for example. Okay, so with SAP, why do we work with SAP on these questions? Is we actually, in the end of the day, we want real, use, um, real world use cases. So we don't want to just be talking about some nice ideas. We'd be able, it'd be nice if someone uses this stuff in the end. Okay. So another direction which was entirely unexpected from starting the fundamental question of what are the quantum resources is it actually helps understand how to demonstrate these. And it turns out that this, this toy model that we had, this Speckens toy model, which is really trying to push the limits between classical and quantum, actually has some important meaning in terms of quantum optics. Okay? So just to say, without going into any details, it turns out that this extended version of this toy model is really like an easy version of quantum optics, which is called Gaussian quantum optics. And so together with the uh, al Kabe lab, in, uh, which is also in Sorbonne University, which is the Nobel Prize winning lab of uh, Serge Aroche, um, they have an optics experiment where they're kind of, we're going to be carrying out these, these kinds of protocols and together with, with Fred and other collaborators, Alham, um, in, in, in Lipsis, we've developed the protocols to do this on their, on their experimental setup. Okay? So we've, we've seen kind of this link down to um, demonstration, which was very unexpected when you're talking about these fundamental questions. The last link is really to this kind of fourth area of our research in terms of quantum network architectures. And the point is here that identifying these quantum resources allows us to understand what are the resources that I'm going to root and how I'm going to root them in my quantum network, okay? So all these different devices connected in different ways, one needs to understand how to do that, okay? And identifying what are the good quantum resources is an important step in this. So we know that we have these different kind of resources in terms of two-party resources, but there are different kinds of resources and multi-party resources as well. And this is really a kind of separation between classical networks and quantum networks again, in, in classical networks, essentially, there is only one resource, which is sending uh, bits of information. Here, these kind of qubits, these multi-party qubits, or two different kinds of two qubit resources, really act as different resources, and they need to be treated in different ways by our networks. Okay? Okay. So we see here, kind of, we start to see how all these different topics are very interrelated, okay? So this is kind of one of the great things of the field of quantum information, is it's very broad, okay? So all these different areas of devices, um, quantum architectures, network architectures, so here we work entirely with classical network architects as well, um, in foundation, so here we're working also with philosophers, and here we're working a lot with kind of, with companies on real, real world use cases and, and researchers in quantum information. And I'll finish with an example which kind of works as a motivation for the talk later today as well, which works in the opposite direction to kind of tell you about how the interconnectedness is not just that direction, but kind of works all the way around. And that's through the work of, of, of Rawad, and so I won't go into any details, but you'll hear about it, um, hear about it uh, uh, after lunch. And so here, this kind of quantum randomness that I've talked about, this kind of, I can make a much bigger version of this, uh, a kind of amplified version of this, if you like, and that's kind of what's behind, or we're beginning to understand is behind these quantum speed up in the architectures that Rawad will talk about, okay? So one of these applications, so, you know, this is the kind of picture, one takes a big entangled state, one performs measurements on this guy, 
And these measurement results are correlated in such a way that no classical computer can give you the same kind of statistics. Okay? And so this is really kind of a new family of resources that could be useful for computation and for networks. And it's also a really important benchmark for these future quantum technologies. Okay? So people like Google, IBM, and Intel, Microsoft, the guys who are building these devices, you know, their first thing they're going to try and do is do these kind of sampling problems. Okay? And so you know, we have these very kind of clear applications. And there is another direction back to here that through understanding these applications, we understand much more about, about the physics that's going on. Okay? So we can kind of take it back. We understand more about uh, what we can do with this non-locality. So you're here tomorrow about kind of what is the role of non-locality and contextuality from Ellie. Um, there's also fantastic, wonderful ideas about how these are related to black hole physics and thermalization, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? So these kind of arrows don't go in just one direction. It's a big kind of big community, really. So you take all of these kind of different directions where people work, and the exciting thing in our field in particular is that really all of these different communities work together. So first of all, they actually do work together. And it's essential that they work together. So the kind of the development of this whole future quantum networks that we're also very excited about really depends on foundations of physics, on the hardcore of the experimental quantum optics, or whichever kind of systems we're going to do, on really understanding how we're going to develop these applications, and talking with net network scientists about how these, uh, how these are all going to fit together. So it's a very exciting and broad uh, field of research, and uh, I hope at least you come away with that. And at that point, I'll just say thank you. That's just a photo of our team in, uh, in, uh, in Lipsis. OK, thank you very much. No idea how over time I was, but just 15 minutes over. That's good for me. I could carry on if you like. Probably enough for everyone hungry. So, uh, if anyone has any question, please come forward. Do not be shy. Okay. Yes. Yeah, sure. So, so, I mean, yeah, I didn't have time to go kind of into the, the history of steering. So in our context, steering is really just that one of your devices is trusted and the other side is not trusted. Okay? But the kind of origins of steering it actually came around uh, in a paper around the same time, 1935, as the EPR paper, where essentially the idea is that making a measurement, if you have an a pair of entangled systems, if I make a measurement on this side, it collapses your system to a correlated state. Okay? So if we took a ball pair and I measured the result zero, and if you perform the same measurement on your side, you would also get the result zero. So this is kind of what people like at the time called steering of the, so it was, it was Schrodinger actually who, who kind of coined the term in German, I guess. But um, the idea is that making a measurement on one half of an entangled state changes by the projections of quantum mechanics. So quantum mechanics, dialectic like theory is very straightforward. It says that measuring this will change the state um, a far away place. And this was what seemed very strange, especially like in light of relativity. It looked like this kind of non-local effect of steering another system seems something that shouldn't be possible, but it turns out. Yeah, right. So it's, it's uh, it, indeed, it kind of sounds like it should allow you to send information faster than light. Fortunately, that's not the case. Otherwise, there's a very good argument to not believe it that Einstein would have been very happy with. But, um, but it turns out that there's a big difference between collapsing something randomly and sending information. So it's true that when I make a measurement on this guy, it changes the um, state of a faraway system. But I can't control how it changes it. 
So if I was able to say I'm going to always get the measurement result zero, you know, so if I was able to choose either get the result zero or one, then I would be able to send this information zero or one. But quantum mechanics works just right at this limit, which says I'm not allowed to signal this information, but I am allowed to have these correlations. And so it's kind of, in fact, it turns out that there is a gap between the kind of laws of physics that one might imagine and quantum mechanics about what kind of correlations there are. So you can, in this kind of notation that I wrote down there, the probability of getting these results given these set of measurements, this is kind of what we call this correlation, language of correlations. There's a broad spectrum of theories that you could think of which are non-signaling. So obviously a good physical theory. So there are kind of, like when we're thinking in foundations, there are certain things that we want any physical theory to satisfy. So we'd certainly want no signaling. And we also want, for example, that it satisfies the second law of thermodynamics. Okay? And so no signaling implies certain constraints on these correlations. And one can explicitly write down the, what these are. Uh, and you see that, in fact, the correlations by uh, quantum mechanics are even more limited than what you could have from a non-signaling theory. So these so-called um, pesco rawlish non-local boxes give you correlations that are much stronger, in a sense, in, the, in a very explicit sense that I can define a game where I can win it perfectly with these uh, non-local boxes that I can't win perfectly with quantum mechanics, but quantum mechanics can still do better than classical physics. So there's a kind of, fortunately, this no signaling doesn't get violated in quantum mechanics, but there's even more possibilities of physical theories beyond that. Right. Yeah. So indeed, yeah, so I wrote down this equation with the lambda as the kind of classical assignment of these potential values. So the short answer is that having one lambda, um, I'm allowed to do all of those strategies. So having just one lambda is a kind of even stronger capacity. So if I, if I can do it with any individual lambdas, I can do it with uh, one lambda. So I'm not restricting my classical attacks. Yeah. No, so, so the question was, if I understand right, you can nod or say yet, is what do I mean by a trusted measurement? Does it mean I don't trust the result, or what does it mean? So explicitly mathematically, it means that I do not know the measurement operation that's happening. So I, I might trust quantum mechanics as a true physical law, okay? So almost everything I talked about, not everything, but almost everything, assumes quantum mechanics is correct, okay? But even if I assume quantum mechanics is correct, so there are these beautiful kind of experiments um, by Vadim Makarov, where a big Russian guy with brilliant big hair, but um, hacking these QKD systems, okay? So it turns out that if you, if you take a QKD system, so of course, theoretically, I know that if Alice, is, Alice and Bob are making these sets of measurements, then it's perfectly secure. Okay. But it turns out that if instead you don't even need to touch their devices, you can kind of shine a laser at them and it basically blinds these detectors in the right controlled way. So it makes them think they're doing certain measurements, but they're actually doing a different measurement. So if in these cases, if you think you're doing a different measurement than what you're writing down in your equation, then you're not really secure anymore. Okay? So when we say untrusted, on a mathematical level, it means that I don't know the measurements that have been performed. On a practical level, it means I don't know the measurements that this, this device is doing. I've got no understanding of the internal workings. And so this is important, for example, if I, if I buy my devices from an untrusted source or if some untrusted source has previous access to them, for example. Okay. So that's kind of uh, what, what we mean by non-trusted measurements. So it's the kind of most paranoid thing you could think of. And they call this kind of whole um, area of research, by the way, device independent security, because it doesn't matter where you get your devices from. It's like, you know, it's only gonna, it's only gonna pass your test if it's a really good device, 
but if it doesn't pass your test, you know that it's, uh, or if it's not secure, then you know it's not going to pass your test. Yes. No. Um, so I like, you know, I'm not an expert of weak measurements, but what I understand about weak measurements, so most of the measurements that we talk about here, it's like a very clear-cut, fixed, projective measurement. Of course, in quantum mechanics, I could have measurements which don't tell you exactly if a, polarize, if a pho photon goes through a polarizing beam splitter, but tells you something, a little bit of information about its polarization, okay? So these kind of weak measurements um, are, yeah, they're kind of not exactly the same projective measurements here, but one can always, there's this kind of very nice notion as a theoretician in, uh, in quantum mechanics, the so-called church of larger Hilbert space, which is that for these weak measurements, or any measurement that I can think of in quantum mechanics, I can always think of this as a very kind of what, what you might call a hard measurement, these projective measurements, on a bigger Hilbert space, okay? So if I'm thinking of my single system, if I appended many ancillas and measured a projective measurement on this, this would what give me this weak measurement, okay? And so these guys are used in... Um, I'm not kind of familiar exactly how they, I know they're useful in certain areas of quantum information and in particular in quantum control. So I guess in kind of quantum control as it's used in quantum information, these weak measurements allow you to get some information about what your system is doing without interfering with it at all. Because I guess the fundamental idea is that measurements in quantum mechanics change your system and interfere with your system. And so these weak measurements kind of try and uh, make the balance there. Okay, so they try and interfere with your system as little as possible, but still give you some information about what's going on. And these have, um, so they kind of appear in, in, as far as I know, in quantum control theory and trying to deal with this decoherence in certain cases. Um, and also in kind of understanding some of the fundamental questions about the nature of measurements. But as a kind of as a technique for quantum information, as far as I know, I mean, uh, Fred and the other guys might have more, more knowledge about how these are used. As far as I know, it's mostly limited to kind of control uh, and quantum control of your systems, as far as I know.